Alrighty, I just want to say thank you so much for being here on today. It is a privilege and honor to be speaking with you guys for the first time. My wife and I shared our testimony a little bit, but this is the first time that they've entrusted me with this stage. So hopefully it won't be my last. So I'm super excited. This week has been an amazing week. I turned 30 on Thursday. Woo! Come on now. Uh, my 20s are done, thank God. But if I know now what I knew back then, come on, somebody. So I'm going to just pray, and then we'll get into it. I'll be done because I have an appointment at Original Steve's. Can I get an amen for the large pancakes? <laughs> amen. Come on now. <laughs> All right, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you so much that we get to just continue in worship, Father. We get to continue to just be in awe of your glory, Father. As we just got done worshiping, as I'm continuing to sweat, my hair is all messed up. I didn't think that I was going to get all messy, but I did. Because, Lord, you moved. R remove me out of the way, Lord, and you move on today. Let your people hear you. Let them not hear me, Father. Yes, Jesus. And we thank you and we see all these things in your precious name, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So my title for today is In the Waiting. Somebody say, In the Waiting. In the Waiting. In the waiting. Say it again. In the waiting. Good job. So if you want this to go a lot faster, when I say like repeat or say amen, if y'all on it, we'll be out of here by 1120. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Glenda's like, amen, let's go. So in the waiting, uh, if you ask my wife, God bless her, please be praying for her actively because I am a very impatient person, okay? She says to be somewhere at 7, I'm leaving the house at 6.15, but that doesn't happen because my beautiful wife has to get ready. She starts getting dressed at 7. So what happens is she's been getting better. We've been together for 12 years, married for almost 8 in, in September, and it'll be like 6.30, and I'm like, I'm itching. I'm on the couch. I'm literally yelling. It's only the two of us in our house. I'm literally yelling, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Babe, we have 10 minutes to go. She's like, I know. Don't rush me. And then I get kind of scared because she might be like curling her hair or blow drying her, and she might throw something at me. But I hate waiting. Also, amusement parks. I wait two to three hours to ride a two-minute ride, not worth it. You move up, you screech up, and then you just wait, you screech up. Even the fast passes at like Disney World, I did go to Disney World. <laughs> um, it was awesome. I have to take you sometime. Church card. Okay. And also, the biggest thing, I love to shop. Uh, Pastor Rochelle and I share that love. We love to shop. I love clothes. I love shoes. Probably a little bit too much. I will buy something on Monday afternoon at like noon, 12.01, I'm looking at the tracking to see where it's at. And I'm like, why isn't it at my house yet? Where, what's happening? I am very impatient, please be praying for me. But it is something that in the waiting process, it gets kind of weird, it gets kind of awkward. So we're gonna be talking about in the waiting. So in the waiting, I'm gonna be talking about how in Luke chapter 15, there's three people that Jesus was talking about. He was talking about two sons and a man. And I love Jesus too because he is pretty dope. I wish I can get to a point that if I want to prove someone wrong or show how dope I am, I just tell a story. Like God's like, oh, really? Guess what? Boom, story. And like mic drops. He's, he's literally the best. So in the waiting, I remember being a kid and my mom and dad knew not to tell me anything. They was like, listen, don't tell Anthony anything. Yes, my middle name is Anthony. I'm a junior. So growing up on my mom's side, my Spanish side, everyone called me Anthony. So they're like, don't tell Anthony anything. Because if they told me we're going to Seabreeze at noon, at 8.04 in the morning, I'm like, so we're going to Seabreeze? We're still going to Seabreeze, right? So are we leaving? They're like, Anthony, we're leaving at 12. Relax. So they knew not to tell me anything because they knew I was impatient. They knew that, listen, he's going to drive us crazy. I, I kind of uh, say sometimes I'm like Donkey from Shrek. Uh, when, <laughs> a little bit too much laughs. When he was um, in the little onion and they were uh, driving to or riding the horses to the castle. And he's like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there? And Shrek just like freaks out. That's me. So they know not to wait. Who in here, by show of hands, likes 
to wait on things or likes to feel very uncomfortable in waiting on things that you know is coming, but you have to wait. Who likes that waiting process? Raise your hand if you do. No one. Thank you. Come on. Because I had a whole sentence here for the person that did raise their hand. Oh, thank God. Okay. So let's look at Luke chapter 15. Verse is 11. Okay. So, Jesus is talking here, and I love the Bible because in the red, growing up, I was like, ooh, the red is serious. You want to read the red because that's God talking. So, to illustrate a point further, mind you, Jesus is talking around a table with people that love Jesus, people that didn't love Jesus. It was a mix of people that, you know, God had to do his thing, and the way he did it was by telling a story. So, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. A man had two sons, the younger son told his father, I want my share of my, <laughs> am I good? Yeah. Okay, no, just feedbacky. Share my estate, however, or how, a state now before you die. So his father agreed to divvy his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land and there he wasted all his money on wild things. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. Repeat after me, in the waiting. In the waiting. And he began to starve. Okay, he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. This portion is so important and it's so amazing because just imagine if this son had waited. If this son had waited to get his inheritance when he was supposed to, he wouldn't have gotten himself in the mess that he got himself into. Amen? Come on now. I heard you, brother. Let the Lord use you, somebody. So... I've been in this place before, and knowing that I knew the call on my life, but I continued to not listen to what God was having for me, what my father wanted me to do. So I was like, you know what? My pride, ego, you know, I'm 18, 19, I, I know everything, right? Because I'm, I'm perfect and I'm super smart. I've lived a whole, whole bunch of years on this earth. I know what to do. But God is like, listen, you have free will to love me. And with free will, you are allowed to do exactly what you want to do. And sometimes that means that we're going to fall flat on our faces. Or if we listen to God and listen to his instructions, we are going to be able to move in excellence, move in power, and move in our dominion that we have. Because we are kings and queens. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. All right. Let's continue to read. Come on. He's with it. Come on now. Verse 16. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food, have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Now, as we know, our senior leader here, Pastor Zach, loves food. I also share, come on somebody, I also share that passion of food, right? Food is great. Can I get an amen? amen. I'm trying to lose weight, y'all, and listen. I be trying. I go to Midtown. It's expensive. That helps a little bit, I guess. But food be just too good. Literally, <laughs> Tiff and I will go to the gym, right? We'll work out, you know, looking nice and swole. We'll get in the car. Want to go Chick-fil-A? God, Lord. <laughs> I just worked out. <laughs> and you know at Chick-fil-A, I'm not getting the salad. I'm not getting the grilled nuggets. I'm getting the number one deluxe. Add bacon. No pickles. Let Come on, somebody. Chick-fil-A sauce, large fry, large Diet Coke. Come on, somebody. 
And then you got to throw in the mac and cheese. You heard? Listen, the mac and cheese is, oh, Lord, come on, somebody. <sighs> so, sad to say, there's no way I'm going to be in some type of mess that I'm going to look at it and be like, mmm, appetizing. But there has been times in my life where I've been in so much mess that I didn't see it. Other people have saw it, and I've been like, yum. And people are like, hey, uh, what are you doing? That's weird, because let's be honest, if someone is eating mess, you're going to try to stop them and be like, hey, that's not normal. But spiritually, I was in a place, and sometimes we get into a place where we're just spiritually just completely in mess, but we don't want any help. And when someone says, hey, I want to help you, you're like, get out of my business. Get out of my business. Pastor Rochelle said something so profound last week. She said, we prayed uh, to, to, to say, Lord, use me in the nations. Use me in the nations. You're not even helping yourself or you're not even talking to your neighbor. You're not even helping that person that's in Wegmans. My wife, listen. I, I, I truly need to learn this from my wife because she has such a pure and loving heart. She'll see someone and immediately she's like, the Lord is telling me to bless them. And in the beginning of our togetherness, I'm like, ah, no, that money belongs to your boy. <laughs> but I realized very quickly that if she is listening and hearing from God, less what guess what, I need to now partner myself into what she is doing and aligning myself to what she's doing because if she's hearing from God and she's doing the good work of God and she's going to get blessed, I'm going to get blessed because I'm listening to everything that she is listening to, which is great news because it's coming from God. So in, oh, I already read that. <laughs> Thanks, babe. She printed these out for me. She's so good. Let the love you, somebody. So Let's go on to verse 20, please. Verse 20. Come on, somebody, y'all on it. So he, the son, returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with joy, or excuse me, filled with love. I'm filled with joy. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It is so profound because someone that had dealt with abandonment of two fathers, my biological father and my stepdad, the one that raised me, I can only imagine the picture of the son saying his apology over and over to himself, just saying, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I shouldn't have done this. I've been, in, I, I, I've been in places in my life where I've been in trouble, and I'm like, okay, how am I going to try to spin it? How am I going to try to say the lie that I lied about but try to cover it with another lie and just try to like work it around instead of just being truthful to myself and confronting it and going completely to that problem, to that issue and facing it head on. I can only imagine that son repeating himself over and over about how he sinned and just saying, okay, I'm sorry, or, or how should I say it? Should it be like, like, let's be honest, kind of crazy. So I remember my first interview, I was in my bathroom. <laughs> I, walked to the, I walked to the mirror and was like, hello, my name is Max. Oh, no, no. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Max. Oh, no, okay, that was too serious. Hi, my name is, okay, I'm too excited. So, like, I can only imagine how this son kept just going and going and being like, okay, how am I going to do this? But the father didn't even want to hear it. And in, and in Middle Eastern cultures, men don't run. They don't run, and I want you to catch this, they don't run because it brings shame to not just them, but to their families. In the Middle Eastern culture, they have these things that cover literally their whole body down to their ankles. They wear sandals. If a man was to run, it would bring shame because you would see his legs, you would see all of his business, and that's not good. The father did not care. He did not care because it states that
Sorry, that's in, that's, that's in the next scripture. So let's go to verse. Let's go to verse 22. But his father said to his servant, quick. Remember, he interrupted him. He didn't want to hear that apology. He didn't want to hear whatever his son was going to say. He ran, got him, embraced him, loved on him. Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring. He was blinging out. Put it on his finger and the flyest sandals. I bet he had the, the dopest ones like the, the, the Air Jordan Jerusalem 11s. <laughs> and kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with the feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. Come on, somebody. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. The son walking to his father, walking. And I can only imagine someone's shout in the waiting. In the waiting. Say it again, in the waiting. Yes, Father. I'm telling you, whew, I can only imagine the Father pacing something like this every day looking for his son. There wasn't a day that passed that he wasn't looking for his son because it states that while the son was a great way off, he wasn't at the front doorstep, he wasn't in the Father's room or in his quarters, he was a great way off. And the father saw him. And his first thing to do was to run and show him, I don't care about religion. I don't care about the norm. I don't care about the customs that we have been grown to. I'm going to show everyone, including my son, that I love him. Yes. And God is continuously pacing and saying, I am here for whenever you need me. When you are in the waiting, when you are in the midst of trials and tribulations, I'm here waiting. And I only want you to make that first step, and I'll do the rest. If we make the first step, church, God will come running. Not walking, not like, oh, here he goes again. He messed up. Oh, here she goes. All right, I told her she was going to do this. He made the step to come home. And his father embraced him with hugs and kisses. When I reconnected with my biological father at 16, I had severe bitterness in my heart. Severe bitterness. When I asked the Lord, Lord, if this is your will, Give me peace and take over. And when I heard his side of the story, and when I just, like, he just opened up his mouth and started to talk, and I began to weep. And it's so crazy. Up until that point, I hadn't heard my father's voice in 14 years. And I heard his voice, and it was like I've heard it my whole life. I was 16. I hadn't heard it in 14 years. And he just began to talk. And I forgave my father. It was such a beautiful thing because that's what God wants for us to do. Let's go to verse 25. I wish I could cry like Pastor Zach. Can we talk about it? I know you guys see it. This man cries and it's like a crystal. Just me. He doesn't have shaky voice. He doesn't get ugly like I do. It's just like, did you go to school for that? <laughs> I went to Elam. They didn't teach me that. Wherever you went, I got to go. Because it's just like, mm -hmm. and I've seen it. Sometimes he'll like bring it back up. I'm like, <gasps> I see it, brother. Come on now. That's why I can't be senior pastor. I got to learn that first. I got to learn it. Okay. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field working. Older son, kind of upset, kind of a lot like me. 
And in this story, we hardly ever talk about the older son. When I was growing up, I only ever heard about the father's love and about the son's return, but I never ever thought to realize to talk about the older son. And when we get done reading the scripture, I'm going to share some stories about how I'm or was a lot like this older son. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. He asked one of the servants, what's going on? Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf. And we are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slayed for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave Wait, sorry. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours comes back from squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. That brother was petty. <laughs> How are you going to tell me you're not going to hear? Mama say, Mama, 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 He heard that. He heard that. Listen, he knew, he knew something was going on. He knew it. He just wanted the validation of someone to come to him and have his father come to him and say what was going on because he didn't want to believe it. This son had unforgiveness in his heart. Like I said it before, my biological father left. Him and my mom got a divorce very early on. Then my mom remarried, who I consider my father, like my dad is, you know, who brought me to this world, but my father is who raised me. And we have a great relationship now, but he left two weeks before my senior, Tiffany's senior ball, and it devastated me. I had prospects to go to college to wrestle. I had D2, D1 scholarships to go wrestle, and... I thought I had my whole life figured out. I met Tiffany. It was a beautiful thing. I was going to wrestle in college, get my criminal justice degree. I was going to be a police officer. And I remember that day so vividly. I, I woke up scared because my mom was sitting at the, at the edge of my bed. And she's crying, like crying. And it was a type of cry where you know that something was wrong. You know when you get that, that, that phone call or you see that person and you just touch their shoulder like me, if, I start to, if I'm about to cry and you like just breathe on me, I, I'm losing it. You only gotta touch me. I'm just, uh. So my biological, or my stepdad left and it devastated me. That was 17 years old. The night before Tiffany's wedding, I could not sleep. I couldn't, couldn't sleep. And God was like, you have to forgive. And I'm like, Lord, bro, I have to write these vows. Because, you know, us men, if you say you wrote your vows before your wedding, you're a liar. <laughs> well, I did write mine, but they were so bad. I had, like, Chick-fil-A sauce and Burger King. And I'm telling you, I love food. You're... So I was trying to write my vows the morning of. It was, like, 2, 3 in the morning, and God said, forgive him. And I'm like, well, it's God, so I can't call him, so I'm going to text him. So I texted him this really, really, really long text message. And just backstory, my stepdad was always texting me, always calling me, always trying to get me to hear his side of the story and always just try to have me hear his heart on why he left, right? But I wanted no parts of it. I would tell, I would tell Tiffany, oh, if I see him, I'm going to fight him. You know, he, he, he's a big black dude. But I'm, I'm going to fight him. I'm going to square up. This man taught me everything. But I'm like, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to learn something. I'm going to watch like Tybo. Remember Tybo? Yeah. Okay, I remember my mom would be like, Whew. I'm like, mom, what are you doing? Get that off the television. It, what is it, Billy Blanks, right? Come on, somebody. So, day of my wedding, I sent this text message, and I felt good at the time because I thought I had forgiven him. First time ever preaching back at the church that I came from at Bethel Christian Fellowship. First time preaching. I didn't tell anybody I was preaching. I was nervous. I preached, and I did exactly what I did today. I played drums, and then I preached. While I'm playing drums, the last song, I see him walk in the door. 
and I just like, I, I, I almost like stopped playing and they thought it was just me feeling the Holy Spirit. But it was me feeling convicted because I truly had not forgiven him. He walked in the door, I preached, and my wife is a testament, I feel so bad for her. Five and a half hours we talked in the parking lot. It was the same exact feeling that I had when I first heard my father's voice. He hugged me. He hugged me and said, I love you. And it's not your fault. And a lot of times in my life, the Heavenly Father has said those exact words to me. And it comes with so much peace. Because we go in life sometimes, and it's like, Lord, I'm trying. It's hard to be good sometimes. (laughs) Coming to church, living right. But all it takes is a reminder from the Father to say you are on the right track. It is not your fault. And keep going. Shout in the waiting. waiting. Come on, shout in the waiting. Verse 31. Mind you, the older son and father having a heated conversation. There's party going on. There's charcuterie boards being passed around. (laughs) Hummus. I bet that hummus is fire back then. Come on now. I tell you, come on. A pita. You know, I bet that bit the pita was great. Verse 31. His father said to him, the older son, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Sometimes I get in these moods where I don't think I have enough or I don't think God's doing enough. These boys were loaded. They didn't have to think where their next meal was coming from. If they had an Amex, it was just swipe central. They didn't have to think about who, if it was going to get declined. When younger, when I was 17, 18, living on my own, it, 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 listen, I'll go, to, I'll go to Taco Bell when they had like $1 tacos. I would get two and hope my car didn't get declined. I was like, Lord, I'm telling you, I've never prayed so hard. I think the first time I spoke in tongues was in the Taco Bell drive-thru. I was like, Rabba, I say tape. She was like, here you go. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, hallelujah. I'm telling you, it's, listen, when money's tight, bro, you get to praying. But I realized very fast that my pride and ego had to go. I was 17, 18 years old, going from couch to couch. My mom moved. My dad, they, they both left Rochester. Um, I'm here venting for myself as a senior, working. My in-laws, they know this, and dad, please don't cry. Um, I owe everything to my mom and dad and my wife. When you surround yourself with people that love you, but that don't want anything in return for that love, that's when you know that it's real. My mom and dad blessed me with my first car. And I say mom and dad. Some people say, why don't you say in-laws? Because they're not my in-laws. They're my mom and my dad. And I look more like their son than my wife and my brother-in-law does. (laughs) Every time I'm with my mother-in-law, we're at BJ's Costco. Oh, my God, your mother. You guys look so nice. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, But... 17, 18, they got me my first car. They helped me get my first apartment. And still in that love, I messed up. I was lying to them. I was lying to my my wife we were dating at the time. 
and pride and ego in the way. Unforgiveness in the way. And I would use the hurts that happened in my life as like, well, you know this happened to me. And my wife was like, yeah, and? And I didn't want to hear that. At 18 years old, I'm like, and? You had a perfect family. You had a white picket fence. She didn't want to hear that. She was like, listen, I'm not going to be dealing with you if you're not going to be able to work this stuff out. So I had to throw my pride and ego out the way because, like I said, I was lying. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. I wasn't walking right with God. And I ended up finding myself sleeping in my car for a month. No one knew. I wasn't paying my rent. I was mismanaging money. I was lying. I was partying. And I found myself sleeping in the car for a month. And God, like, clear as day, like, I, 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 sometimes I hear people be like, oh, God said this to me. God said this to me. I was at Wegmans, and God told me to get the Cheerios, not the Frosted Flakes. I'm not the type of person, when God does talk to me, I know it's true and real because it, when it does happen, it happens. And yet again, God, while I'm in my back of my, like, 2007 Pontiac Grand Prix with leather seats, no heat, dead of winter, I'm struggling. The Lord says to me, get it together. Get it together. Just like the younger son, looking at mess and almost at a point of indulging in the mess, get it together. Came to his senses. The older son being bitter for however many years the younger son was gone, wasting away his money. The older son being upset and bitter and not realizing his place with his father and knowing that everything that he was surrounded by someday would be his. I would think if I had a rich family and I had a mansion, okay, bye, I'll get the pool house, I'll make sure I get the large bathroom with a jacuzzi pool in it, I wouldn't care. But he had unforgiveness in his heart. And just like me, 18 years old, sleeping in my car, God saying, get it together. Max, get it together. And I had to check myself. And my wife is really funny. I don't know if she's remember this, but she told me once when we were dating, she was like, "Um, I'm not a girlfriend. I said, what? She's like, I'm not a girlfriend. I'm a wife. So whatever you got going on, you better figure it out because I know the calling on my life, and I see the potential, but you're going to have to get this together. Shout in the waiting. waiting. Shout in the waiting. waiting. And I find myself waiting in my car, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. God is like, I've been here, son. I've been here. When your father left when you were two, when your father left when you were 17, I've been here. I've been longing, because God gives us free will. All he wanted was for me to take that first step and say, Lord, I am here. Do whatever you want to do in my life. And I completely, at that moment, surrendered and never looked back. Now when I worship, I worship for all those other young Maxes out there that feel abandoned or that feel like they're not being loved, that they don't have a father's love, or that they feel misunderstood, or they have unforgiveness in their heart because something happened to them. And I tell you today, church, that I'm not minimizing what happened in your life. But when we partner with God and look in the mirror and face it head on, with what God has for us and the power that God has, we can see ourselves on the other side. So I'm getting ready to close. Oh, look at, look at God. Come on. So, oh, yes, Father. Oof. Yes, Father. Mm. Yes, Jesus. 
I'm going to open up the altars. Yes, Father. I'm going to open up the altar for those people that need that Father's love. Also, if you have unforgiveness or resentment in your heart, this altar is not an altar of shame, but it's an altar of freedom and deliverance. This church is not about who's up here for what, but it's about how you look coming back. If everybody can stand. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. My God. Father. Yes, Father. I'm telling you, if you want deliverance, it is here. Just make that first step. The altar is open. Make that first step. If you need that Father's love, it's here. If you need to get that unforgiveness and resentment out of your heart, just come. Yes, Father, we thank you for today, Lord. Lord, we thank you that we are free in you, Lord. That you give us everything that we need, Lord. You are our Abba. The love that you give is unconditional. We don't deserve it, but you give it to us anyways. Yes, Jesus. You give it to us anyways, Father. Lord, and I pray right now for every single person to feel the wind that's in this room right now. Yes, Father. They feel the wind on today, Lord. Yes, Father. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Father, that they feel the wind, Lord, and that they know that that thing or that person that they need to forgive, that as soon as they make that step to the altar, that burden will be completely lifted. I held on it for way too long, and now that I'm free from it, it feels so, so good to be living in a place knowing where my love comes from knowing that I don't have that unforgiveness in my heart for my Father. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Father. We thank you for who you are, Jesus. 